so, um, welcome to everybody. <clears throat> this is the <clears throat> lecture series of the System and Man and Cybernetic Society, the Italian chapter. The um, IEEE means Institute for of Electrical and Electronics Engineering and uh, <clears throat> System Man and Cybernetic Society is uh, a society that uh, um, has three main um, area of develop or research, one devoted to human, one devoted to systems, and the other one devoted to cybernetics and control. And uh, <clears throat> there are uh, the main conference uh, is will be this year the SNC conference in 2023 will be in Maui and uh, the deadline is approaching soon this year. This is the membership uh, fee you want to become a member. Uh, we have organized this uh, lecture series and we today we have the third one that is uh, um, given by Dario Bauso from uh, Groningen uh, Center for System and Control at the University of Groningen in Netherlands. And the title is Opinion Dynamics for Traffic Control in Theoretical Approach. <clears throat> in Torino, uh, in July, there will be also, <clears throat> in June, sorry, uh, no, in July, there will be also a, the first uh, System Man and Cybernetic Item Chapter Day, with, where uh, many of us uh, will present their uh, work. And uh, some words uh, related to our um, speaker. So he was, uh, he graduated in aeronautical engineering in 2000 and got his PhD in uh, system theory in 2004 from the University of Palermo. He's associate, he has been associate professor of uh, operational research uh, at the Department of Engineering at the University of Palermo and from 2018 is a full professor in the, uh, in the University of Groningen in the Netherlands. <clears throat> and is the chair of the uh, operational research uh, um, laboratory. And his the expertise is both in uh, operational research uh, and in control, and uh, in particular is interested in uh, optimization, distributed control, and game theory. So now I uh, give the floor to uh, Dario. Uh, so please, Dario, start your talk. Thank you. Thanks, Lara, for, for the invitation. Uh, let me just share my screen. So can you please confirm that you can see the slides? Yes. OK, one second. I will put it uh, full screen. OK, shall I start? Can you hear me well? Yes. All right, thanks for the invitation. So today I'm, I'm going to talk about opinion dynamics, a game theoretic approach. And when we talk about opinion dynamics, one thing we want to achieve is consensus. So let's look at how nature uh, offers uh, examples of consensus. Imagine you have two equally favorable options, option one and option two. And you have to make a decision uh, about which one of the two options to uh, accept. And, and now imagine you have a group of people who have to get consensus on whether to go for option one or option two. And this is indeed what happens when you have a honeybees, a group of honeybees, a swarm of honeybees. So what happens in nature is uh, you have uh, so-called uh, scouting bees. They leave the uh, swarm and they go in exploration. So and when they like a place, they start a so-called uh, waggle dance. So the waggle dance is just an oscillatory movement uh, which is used to signal the rest of the swarm, uh, let's put our nest box here because this is a good place. So that's this is a first phenomenon which is observed in nature. A second phenomenon is called uh, cross inhibitory signaling. So what happens is other bees who are committed to uh, a different option, um, they can send uh, so-called stop signals or cross inhibitory signals and uh, to prevent uh, scouting bees from eating. Okay, so these are two main phenomena that you can observe in nature and they can, keep, can be captured uh, in, in a mathematical model uh, as explained next. So if we look at the literature, uh, and usually I'm talking about literature at the intersection between uh, uh, theoretical biology and nonlinear analysis, 
uh, what we find is usually a, a sort of a Markov chain. So we have a, a discrete state Markov chain. Uh, so in, in the case of two options, we have three states. Uh, so state number one uh, is uh, uh, associated to a the fraction of, of the population which is committed to option one. Uh, the state number two is the fraction of population committed to option two. And then you have state number three, which is the fraction of uncommitted population. So these are uh, the bees who still have to decide uh, for which option uh, to opt. Uh, then we look at the transition rates. So what we observe here, we usually have a constant term, which is gamma. So this is uh, about the value of the option. So the higher the value of option one, the higher the transition rate from uncommitted to option one. Um, and then you have a linear term. So the linear term is uh, depending on, on the fraction of population committed to uh, option one. So this is exactly the waggle dance. So that's one way to capture the waggle dance. The, the higher the fraction of people committed or bees committed to option one, the higher the probability that you have waggle dancers. And that's why you have this linear term, which is proportionally increasing in, in, in X1. Uh, this is usually a symmetric model because the two uh, options are equally favorable. If one option is much better than the other one, then uh, the problem trivializes. Uh, everybody knows which is, which the, what is the, the best option to, 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 to go for. Uh, and now let's look at the transition back from state one to state three. So these are Bs who have already committed to option one and they want to reconsider their, their, their uh, decision. So initially, again, you have a constant term, which is alpha. Usually alpha is uh, the inverse of the value of the option. So the, the lower the value of the option, the more Bs reconsider and they transition into an uncommitted state. And then you have, uh, uh, again, a linear term. But this time, this linear term depends on how many Bs are committed to the opposite option. You see the term sigma x2. So the more Bs are committed to the opposite uh, option, uh, the stronger the cross inhibitor signal is and the higher the transition rate from one to three is. Uh, if we assume that the population has no births, no deaths, so we have a conservation mass, the sum of X1 plus X2 plus X3 is equal to one. And then, then we, can, we can essentially simplify the model. So we can, uh, everything boils down into a uh, B-dimensional model uh, in the variable X1 and X2. So we know that- Sorry, Dario. Is... Sorry, Dario. Are you talking on the first slide or you are supposed to move on? No, I'm, I'm moving. So it's- Oh, it no, is... it's not. We are still on the first one. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I don't know. Let, let me try again to- You maybe need to go down with the- Yes, let me, let me try again. So ah, okay. I'll stop sharing. I'm stop sharing. Okay. Oh, you should have told me. Earlier. No, sorry, so now, I thought you were just talking. Uh, no, no, I was, I was uh, moving to slide number four. Uh, so let me try again. So screen, let's try this. Uh, Maybe you should go manually. Yeah, I, I'm sharing now the entire screen, not just the PDF. Okay. So maybe it works better. So how is it now? Do you see uh, the, the slide uh, existing no. model? No. Click on the slide. We see teams now. Put so the now slide on front. Do you see uh, the slide existing model? No, we see just the teams ourselves. Ah, uh, okay. I'm sorry, but. Uh, okay. Yeah. Try again. Sure. How about now? Okay, now I see slide number number two, I think. So this is existing model, the title. Yes, yes. Okay, okay. So I'm not touching anything. Okay, I will I will continue even if it's not full screen. Maybe it's better to leave it as this. Yeah. Shall I? Okay. So this is uh, so if you look at the so i i, I was uh, explaining the the typical model that you can find in the literature it's a markov chain so you see in in the slide uh, you have three nodes uh, each node is is uh, uh, 
uh, associated to a, a variable. So you have X1, X2, and X3. And X1 is the fractional population which is committed to option one. X2 is the fractional population committed to uh, option two. And X3 is the fraction of population which is uncommitted. Um, we can uh, look at the transition rates, which is the parameter that you see uh, uh, next to each R. And uh, you see there is a gamma term, so a constant term. And usually this gamma term is proportional to the value of the option. So the higher the value of the option, the higher transition rate from uncommitted to uh, option one. And then you have a linear term. The linear term is the waggle dance. This term depends on the fraction of, of Bs who are already committed to option one. So then the higher probability you have waggle dancers in option one. Uh, the, the system is symmetric, the model is symmetric. So whatever I'm saying for state one uh, holds true also for state two. Uh, and then let's look at the transition back from one to three. So uh, you have a constant term alpha, and this is usually inverse proportional to uh, the value of option one. So the smaller the value of the option, the higher the transition uh, from one to three, which means on ABs who reconsider uh, their original uh, commitment, and now they want to uh, consider again the possibility of going for option two. And then you have the linear term. The linear term is the cross inhibitory signaling. Uh, it depends on X2, the fraction of population which is committed to the opposite option. Uh, if we assume that there are no births, no deaths, the population, we have conservation mass. So the sum of X1 plus X2 plus X3 is equal to one. Uh, also in terms of derivatives, we know that X.3 is going to be minus X.1 minus X.2. So essentially we can simplify uh, the model into a b-dimensional uh, model, not linear. Uh, and uh, so if we look at the first equation, then you have that the, the rate of increase of uh, Bs committed to option one uh, is the Bs who are uncommitted multiply the transition rate from three to one. You can interpret this model in terms of the flow model, it's a flow model, minus the outgoing flow, this is uh, how many Bs are committed to option one, multiply the transition rate from one to three. And similarly for uh, the second uh, state. So if you look at the literature, the main, uh, the main results, the most interesting results are uh, about the role of this uh, threshold sigma. And uh, in particular, uh, sigma plays a, a major role in, in uh, helping uh, the swarm reaching consensus. Uh, let me just explain this a little bit more in details. Uh, if we want to model the population dynamics, then uh, what we obtain is a trajectory in the simplex in R3, right? We have a trajectory in X1, X2, and X3, and we know that the sum is equal to one. So then uh, the trajectory describing the time evolution of the population is in this triangle, which is uh, uh, drawn in, in, uh, to the left of these slides. So the vertices, which has the red circles, uh, actually corresponds to uh, the entire population committed to option one, the entire population committed to option two, or the entire population uncommitted. Uh, on the right, we see the, the we, we, we have a graph, which is actually uh, borrowed from, from an existing uh, paper in the literature published in 2013 in PLOS One. Uh, this graph tries to explain the role of this cross inhibitory signal. So you have two different uh, areas, the gray and the white area. Uh, the gray area uh, usually covers situation where the cross inhibitory signaling parameter is uh, weak, so small value for sigma, and small value for V. So the, the quality of the options is poor. So when this happens, uh, what we have is uh, one equilibrium point, uh, which is very close to the barycenter of the triangle. Uh, so one third, one third, one third, which means one third of the population at steady state is remaining in the uncommitted state. And this is not something good from any, uh, from in terms of the, of the application. Uh, and this is uh, asymptotically stable. So if, wherever you start from, then the, 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 the trajectory will converge to these equilibrium points. So a steady state, there is a, a, a substantial portion of the population who is uncommitted. Uh, if you increase the cross inhibitory signal in parameter sigma and you increase the value of the option, you transition from the gray to the white area. In the white area, there is what nonlinear analysts call a bifurcation. So essentially the original equilibrium point 
now becomes unstable. And there are two new equilibrium points arising very close to the vertices A and B, which are uh, asymptotically stable. That means if you are in the equilibrium, in the central equilibrium, you stay there. But if you have a small perturbation from the equilibrium, then the dynamics will converge to either one vertex or the other one. And this is what we want in nature, because that means that the whole population will converge to one option. And this is consensus. So, so far, this is something which is already in the literature. So when we started looking at this uh, problem, uh, we decided we wanted to adopt a different perspective. Uh, and uh, in particular, the, the literature so far provided uh, uh, models uh, which were, uh, so usually you had these models and you say, okay, this is how the population behaves. And now we analyze the model. The, the, the perspective we wanted to enforce was different. Uh, how can we design a game in a way that in the end, we obtain exactly the same behavior that we obtain from those models? So that's what we call prescriptive approach. So that's the main difference between a descriptive versus a prescriptive approach. So in the contribution that we try to give to this uh, area of research, uh, we adopted this idea of prescriptive uh, uh, approach. So essentially, we want to design a game. And designing a game means that we want to design the parameters beta. Beta are transition rates in a way that, in the end, this game is returning the same behavior that was observed from the existing models. Uh, the details of what I'm uh, talking about today are in, in this uh, paper, uh, which is a collaboration with uh, one of my previous students uh, in Sheffield and other Stella. Now he's a, a lecturer in Birmingham and, and Patrizio Colaneri, uh, a, a colleague uh, at Polytechnic in Milan. And essentially what we try to, to, to do is to bring together our expertise. And for the first time, we are looking at mythic games as switched system. So that's going to be the main message of this talk. In a few slides, I will emphasize that the, the take home message is you can solve a mean field game, and now we see what we mean by solving a mean field game by looking at the equilibrium points of a switching system. So that's uh, the, the, the take home message, which is coming soon. Let's talk about the model. So, the model, it's a mean field game. So, in a mean field game, you usually have the microscopic model. So, we look at the reference player, one single player, and the single player can be in one of the three states. So, it can be in state one, state two, or uncommuted. So, this is a discrete state space for the reference player, the red guy. And what the red guy does, he selects the control transition rate. So he can decide the probability with which you want to switch from one state to another one. So let's call it rho ij. But at the same time, you also have some uncontrolled disturbance. So the transition rate from i to j is also depending in an additive way by some disturbance. So the WIJ is something that you cannot control. The single individual cannot control the WIJ. So the resulting transition uh, rate, beta IJ, is, the, uh, is obtained by overlapping the control part, which is rho IJ, that the reference player can control, and the uncontrolled disturbance. And then we have the population. So next to the individual player, we have a population of individual. I'm using the color blue to uh, distinguish when I talk about the, the micro and the macro part of the model. So for the macroscopic part of the model, the population is uh, described by the distribution, right? So if we have uh, three values for x1, x2, x3, and the total uh, has to sum up to one, then this accounts for how the, the population distributes uh, according to the three, over the three uh, possible states. So the state that describes the population is a point in the blue triangle. The individual, the reference player, is jumping from one red circle to another one. The population is continuously evolving in this blue triangle. The single player is smart. So it's actually selecting the transition rate uh, in order to minimize some cost. Uh, and uh, now I'm, I'm, I'm using the same uh, construction that we usually have in, in optimal control. So the cost that we want me, that, that the individual player wants to minimize depends on his own state, I, the distribution of the population that creates the coupling between the individual and the population, and the transition rate. And how is this dependence? Well, usually the control is penalized, right? We cannot uh, uh, inject. Uh, too much energy into the system. So usually we have a, a quadratic penalty in the control. In this case, is the first term. 
which is quadratic in the in the row ij. Think of the row ij as the, the control part. And, and then you have a second part. So in this case, we are separating the, 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 the penalty on control from the congestion term. The congestion term is that term which depends on the distribution. And this is interesting because uh, if, if this function is uh, monotonically increasing, then what we are capturing is what we call a crowd averse behavior. So this is a game. So then the terminology crowd averse means I tend to avoid uh, states that are highly congested. If this function is monotonically decreasing, we are capturing exactly the opposite. So we have people who wants to be in states that are highly congested, where the, con the concentration, the distribution is high, right? So depending on how we model FI, we can uh, capture both type of behavior. For this example, uh, we want uh, a, 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 a consensus. Consensus means, means crowd seeking. We want to be in the place where all the other people are. So by the way, one thing I forgot to say is we started with uh, talking about honeybees and then at some point now we are talking about the model. Uh, when talking about the model, I'm not using anymore the terminology honeybees. I'm talking about players. Uh, I will uh, go back to the terminology of bees towards the end of this presentation. So at the end of this presentation, we'll bring together the honeybees that we introduced at the beginning and hold the, 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 the discussion on, on the mean field game that we are uh, uh, providing now. So the, the individual player, the reference player is farsighted, which means he wants to minimize the cost over a uh, horizon, right? The horizon can be uh, long uh, from T to capital T. Uh, so the, the, the cost appears as an integrand of, of, the, of, the, of the cost. Uh, remember, this is a stochastic model, so we, we take expectation. This is the expected value of the of the transition uh, starting in state i at time t, and based on the transition rate rho and w. So we have the 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 the, the cost that I introduced before, which takes into account the congestion term, and then you have uh, the energy uh, of the disturbance. So we have to penalize the energy of the disturbance. You probably recognize a kind of h infinity structure, right? So we want to penalize the disturbance, otherwise we can't really find a solution to this problem. And then you have a terminal penalty as in every finite horizon optimal control problem. Uh, so if you let me, uh, if you allow me uh, uh, to use uh, a technical jargon, what we're talking about in, in a second is a robust mean field game. So it's, it's a mean field game because we bring together the micro and the macro part of the model, and it's robust because we have the additional disturbance. Uh, and what usually people do with robust mean field games, uh, essentially you have to solve a kind of what, what is called the hamilton jacobi isaac equation. So essentially we have to solve an in-soup uh, 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 equation uh, in the in the cost function of the lab. Uh, the solution of this uh, in soup equation is called the value function. And how do we obtain this value function? Well, this is actually things that are already in the literature. So usually the value function is the solution of this set of uh, uh, qualities. Uh, on the right hand side, it's an ordinary differential equation. On the right hand side, uh, you, uh, you see the, uh, what is called the robust Hamiltonian. The robust Hamiltonian uh, is obtained by solving an in-soup problem. So the infimum uh, with respect to the control part, remember the, the reference player wants to minimize the cost, and the supremum with respect to the disturbance. So the disturbance is trying to mess up things. Uh, let me just uh, emphasize the structure of this Hamiltonian, robust Hamiltonian, because that uh, that will have some implication in the solution of the problem. So this is a linear quadratic. So the, 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 the cost G is quadratic in the controlled uh, transition rate rho i. Uh, you have a quadratic uh, penalty term in the uh, uh, Wij, which is the uncontrolled transition rate. Uh, and then you have the, the, the cost state part, which is linear in rho i and Wi. Why is this interesting? Because when you look for the solution of this robust Hamiltonian, you, you solve the imp soup. Essentially, just because this is a con convex concave problem, then you take the derivative, you take it to zero, and what you obtain is that the optimal, the optimal transition rate is minus r. R is a matrix, so it's a constant matrix uh, multiplied by this uh, delta b. So this is the the difference in the in the in the value function between two different states. So you can see the explicit expression on the right hand side. Uh, but let let's let's Keep in mind this structure. So the optimal transition rate is minus r delta b. 
So delta B is the is the difference in the in the value function in state one and in state i and in all other states in state i. Uh, but you can think of it as a potential difference. Okay, so that's it's very convenient, it's very intuitive to look at this delta i vu uh, like a potential difference and notes. Okay, we have this kind of uh, ele electrical analogy. And uh, we obtain something similar for the W. So the uncontrolled uh, transition rate is also depending on a constant matrix gamma i times a delta i. Now it looks like everything is linear. In reality, this is a piecewise linear because it depends everything on the sign of these different potential difference. So as long as the sign is unchanged, then it's a linear uh, control. But then you have switching. Right, and that, this is where the switching part comes into into play because when you solve these Hamilton, robust Hamilton, Jacobian uh, equation, Isaacs, then you have to look at the at the sign to make sure that the sign of these potential difference doesn't change. So let's remember the, the structure of the rho i star omega i star that will come uh, again in a, in the next slides. So what we do then we bring uh, both the individual, the microdynamics and the macrodynamics together. So the, the microdynamics uh, is in red in these slides and essentially accounts for how the individual responds based on a population distribution. So tell me how the population is distributed and I will tell you how each individual player will respond. So that's why we call it micro. Uh, and then you have the view dynamics and this is how the population will redistribute uh, if every individual So that's, that's this is the typical structure of an infield game. So you have the macrodynamics and the macrodynamics that are brought together in the same model in a consistent way. And uh, if you look at the boundary conditions, uh, uh, the boundary condition for the distribution is at time zero. So we assume that we know how the population is distributed at time zero. And the uh, boundary condition for the value function is at time t. So that's why this is called initial terminal value problem. So we have to solve this set of coupled qualities, but with boundary conditions at different times. And that creates an additional uh, challenge in the solution uh, in solving the problem. The, the first, uh, usually the first uh, question that we ask ourselves when we have to uh, deal with such a problem is whether a subtle point exists, right? It's an insuit, so we want to look for subtle, subtle points. And because of the, uh, of the structure of this uh, problem, then we were able to say, yes, it exists. A subtle point exists, and it can be obtained by solving the argument max problem that you see at the end of this slide. So that was a kind of preliminary comment. Uh, the second comment is uh, solving uh, this uh, robust mean field game actually boils down into finding uh, mean field equilibria. So, or more in particular, worst case mean field equilibria. Uh, what is a mean field equilibrium? Essentially, is a solution to this set of ordinary differential equations in the variable x and b. So give me a, 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 a value for x as a function of time. So we're talking about function, the solution are functions. So give me a, a trajectory for x and give me a trajectory for b and substitute these trajectories into the blue and the red uh, uh, equations and let's make sure that everything uh, is, is, is satisfied, that the, the set of equations are satisfied. So this is the, what we call, it's also called the fixed point, right? Uh, usually, finding a fixed point for the red and the blue equations is quite challenging. Uh, one thing we can do is to simplify and to look at the stationary uh, worst case mean field equilibrium. What, that, what does it mean? Uh, we take all the derivatives equal to zero. So we look only at the, at the steady state uh, solution for this uh, robust mean field game. So we take the x dot equal to zero, we take the b dot equal to zero, and then this is what we want to solve. We want to find a set of a solution to the set of equalities, the solution are in terms of the x and the v, and the set of equality are the ones displayed uh, in the bottom of this slide. This idea of a stationary worst case mean field equilibrium, by the way, is already in the literature, so it's in the paper by 2013. So sometimes you can, it's too complicated to solve, uh, uh, the, the, to, to analyze the time evolution of the system. So let's see if there's, we can say something about the steady state solution of the system. And we will call these a worst case mean field equilibrium, stationary mean field equilibrium. So the main contribution as anticipated uh, a few slides earlier is the following one. If we want to find the stationary worst case mean field equilibrium, then what we have to do is to look for the equilibria of a dynamical switched system. 
So once again, that's the take home message. We want to calculate, we want to obtain a robust mean field equilibrium, stationary robust mean field equilibrium for a mean field game, for a robust mean field game. What shall we do? Well, we have to analyze a dynamical switch system and look at the equilibrium points for that, for that, for that system. So that, that's the main thing. And please note that when I say mean field equilibrium, the concept of equilibrium is different because this is, uh, this is the asymptotic interpretation of a Nash equilibrium. It's, so the same word equilibrium has a different meaning that when I say equilibrium of a dynamical system, what well, we know that this is actually by, by taking all the derivatives equal to zero. All right, so now how can we obtain the solution? How can we, let me try to explain how we can uh, turn from a uh, robust mean field game into a uh, dynamical uh, switching system. Uh, essentially, what we obtain is uh, equation one and two. So still the equation one in a second, I will show, uh, I will try to convince you that this is uh, indeed the uh, macroscopic dynamic. So this is account, this accounts for the distribution of the population. And the red equation, which is the number two, is actually uh, nothing but the, the, the Amitor, uh, Jacobi is X equation uh, where, where, where the variable is the value function, okay? But now this looks like a switched system, right? You see, this is a, a non-linear, uh, uh, it's uh, actually a quadratic uh, dynamical system uh, and uh, the matrices on the right-hand side depends on sigma. Sigma is a, uh, is a uh, index. Uh, sigma indicates uh, the quadrant where we are in, in terms of the, of the sign of the, of the Y variables. So we have four options. The y variables are both positive, then we are in the first quadrant. Uh, one positive, one negative, we are in the, in the second or, or uh, third quadrant, or uh, fourth quadrant, and then both negative, we are in the third quadrant. All right, so that, that's, that this is a switched system. We recognize this as a switched system. And we also see here the boundary conditions at time zero and at time t for the two set of variables, the psi and the y. Uh, so let me just uh, now comment a little bit on this switched system. And uh, in, 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 in one minute, we see that this switched system is corresponding to the robust mean field game. And if I manage to convince you about that, then that's really a success. Uh, so the first thing that I want to emphasize here is the send direction. So if you look, so first of all, this is a switched system. So for every quadrant, you have different matrices. You see this is quadrant one and the matrix is A1 and, and, and the vector is G1. And then this index actually accounts for the quadrant where we are. So that's the, uh, the, the, the nature itself of the switched system. So the second thing is if Y1 and Y2, they are both positive, remember the definition of Y1. Y1 is the potential difference uh, between node three and node one. And Y2 is the potential difference between node three and, y, and, and node two. So essentially, what we have here is a descent direction. So when we move from uncommitted to option one, then the value function is going to decrease. And when we move from one to three, the value function is going to increase. Indeed, what's happening here in, in, in the first quadrant is each individual player, the red player, the reference player, wants to move towards one or two, because these are the descent direction. And the disturbance is pushing the reference player back to three. And analogous interpretation you have in the other quadrant. Right, so we, first of all, we recognize that there are some descent and ascent direction, and we know what the reference player is trying to do and what the disturbance is trying to do. Uh, the second comment is about the nature of, of the matrices and vector appearing in the dynamics. So these matrices depend only on the penalty cost parameters. So you see, matrix A1 depends on the R and gamma. Gamma are the penalty costs for the for the control and the disturbance in the mean field game. Uh, we'll make use uh, of some mathematical manipulation to show that if we do this kind of uh, uh, addition, then we obtain a diagonal matrix, which is Metzler. Okay, we'll use this in the proof, but this is just something that we observed here. So if we, if we just sum two times G1 to the matrix here, then we obtain this interesting uh, matrix here. It will be used uh, in one of the theorems. Uh, the third comment is about uh, well, this is probably the most important one. I want to convince you that the switched system corresponds to the robust mean field game. So let's look at the, this is the switched system in the first quadrant, right? So let's look at the uh, blue part. So the R31 inverse multiplies one minus X1 minus X2. So this is R31 inverse, one minus X1 minus X2, multiplied by Y1. 
Okay, so this is what we have from, from the dynamics. But do you see here that this is exactly the, the, the fraction of uncommitted multiply the optimal transition rate, the rotary one. You remember the R3 inverse multiply delta B? Well, one is actually delta B, right? So, so then we recognize that this is indeed accounting for the blue part in the mean field gain. And how about the, the, the transition back from one to three? Well, we have gamma one three with minus sign, which multiplies minus x one, multiply y one. But do you recognize this as the worst case disturbance when we solve the, 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 the and we obtain the, the affine, the piecewise linear uh, uh, transition rates, then this was exactly the, the, the expression that we obtained multiplied by x one. So the number of, uh, of committed people in option one, okay? So I don't know whether I was uh, successful in convincing you, but it should be clear now that uh, the switch system we are looking at is actually a different way of rewriting the, the, the Hamilton Jacobi Isaacs equation and the mass conservation equation, the dynamics and the dynamics of the robust mean field game. So if we are on the same page and we accept that this is true, then let's start analyzing the switch system. The first preliminary consideration is that uh, we have one equilibrium point uh, in each orbit. And this is obtained by uh, just taking the round brackets equal to zero, right? So we have four different equilibrium points. Remember, this is a switched system, one per each quadrant. So that's preliminary uh, observation. Uh, we move next to the first result. That we can provide, and uh, beyond the, the technicality of the, of the of the result, I want also to uh, to emphasize the the, the the technique, the method that we used. So we have two coupled uh, equations. One is the macro, and the other is the micro. So what we are doing now, step one, we fix, we make some assumption about the uh, uh, the, the y. Remember, the y is the individual rationality, the micro dynamics, and we solve for the macro. So we make some assumption about how the individuals behave, and then we solve for the population distribution. We say, okay, if the individuals behave this way, this is how the population is going to evolve. And if we do this, and in particular, if we fix the sign of the Y, which means we are looking at one quadrant, and we are assuming that dynamics is confined in that quadrant, then what we obtain is that we have one equilibrium point. This equilibrium point is also asymptotically stable. All right, so if we assume that the, that the dynamics for the, for the X, the distribution of the population, doesn't leave the quadrant, then it will converge asymptotically to that unique equilibrium point in that quadrant. Okay, that's theorem one. Now we revert things. We make an assumption on the distribution and we look at how the individuals adapt. And this is step two. So in step two, we assume that the distribution is fixed. So we say, okay, now the population is fixed. Uh, the distribution. Let's see how the value function dynamics evolve. And what we were able to do is to prove that there exists one equilibrium point, or let me say it differently, there exists one quadrant which, which has an equilibrium point which is consistent with the microscopic dynamics. And this is the expression of the equilibrium point. To do this, what we need to do is to introduce uh, these so-called Papillion measures. This is a typical trick in, in switched system. Uh, you can use this quaternion matrix actually to turn every quadrant into the positive uh, quadrant. So suppose you, you, that, that, that you are in the third quadrant where the, the, the sign of the, of the variables uh, are negative. If you pre-multiply x1 and x2 by j1, then you turn the sign into a positive. So this is a trick to turn every quadrant or every orthant in the n-dimensional space into a positive orthant. So any, we use this quaternion matrix to uh, retrieve back the, the, the sign of the equilibrium point. So what we are doing now is assume that the population is fixed, the distribution. Let's solve for the hamilton jacobi isaac equation. And then, then there is a quadrant where we can find one equilibrium point. So step three. Step three is about bringing the two things together. So now we bring tier one and tier two together. And what we can say is there exists one quadrant uh, which is characterized by this uh, inequality. 
where there exists a, an equilibrium point in the distribution and an equilibrium point in the, in, the, in the value function that are consistent with each other. So indeed, you see that the value of the equilibrium in the distribution appears explicitly in the equilibrium for the, for the value function. So we can say that the fixed point exists and is unique. Remember, the fixed point is what we call at the beginning the robust stationary mean field equilibrium. Uh, we also moved a little bit uh, uh, further because we also want to know whether we can calculate this equilibrium. Okay, so if you have a gain, you first want to know whether an equilibrium exists, is unique, but whether you can also calculate this equilibrium. And usually you can use these shooting techniques. Uh, in this case, what we do is we stretch the horizon from minus two to t, and we stretch t to infinity, so that means we stretch the horizon, and then we look at what happens at time zero. And this is indeed what we observe that we have convergence to the uh, solution obtained in theorem three for these dynamics. So that's that's about the calculation. You can think of it as analyzing the dynamics of the, of the coupled uh, set of equations, but also as a calculation method, right? Because in the end, when you converge, you know the value of psi bar and y bar. So this is. Uh, about the, the prescriptive model. Remember, we started with Onibis, and I told you something about what's in the literature. Then I started talking about mean field game and how we can design a game in order to retrieve the original Onibis model. Let's go back to exactly to that question. So the first one you see on top is the Onibis model. You recognize here the, the cross inhibitor signaling and the wobble dance. And then we have the, 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 this is a part of the switched model, right? We recognize this one is the switched model, which can be rewritten. Actually, you can just rewrite in this way, okay? Uh, after hmm, I, I rewrote uh, at the end of the slide, you can see an, an, an explicit uh, expression for these, uh, for these switching models. So now the question is, how can we make sure that this model corresponds to this model? So, or in other way, in other words, how can we design the parameters of the switched model uh, in order to retrieve back the honeybees model? And this is possible. And uh, it's possible if we, if we do some, some, some uh, mathematical manipulation. In particular, what we do is we have to make sure that the red terms, the green terms, the blue terms, and the gray terms are equal. Okay, so essentially we, are, we have to solve uh, for a set of four uh, equalities in the in the parameters g1, g2, y1, and y2 in the variable g1, g2, y1, g2, y2. Now these are variables for for this uh, problem. I don't want to uh, go too much into the details, but essentially we are. If you equalize the terms, then essentially what we obtain is that yes, it is possible to design the parameter. And let me just give you some some physical intuition. Uh, remember, this is uh, this is uh, the original Markov chain, and this is the penalty cost uh, for the transition rate from three to one, and this is the, the the penalty cost for the for the uncontrolled for the disturbance, right? So, can we think of these R and gamma as uh, resistance to transition? Because this is a cost. So, if we increase R, then it's like increasing the resistance to transition from three to one, and similar interpretation for one to three. So, essentially, yes. It is possible to uh, make sure that the two models uh, coincide if we uh, make sure that the fraction between the, the resistance to transition between node three and one and one and three, which is actually accounted by these uh, R three one over gamma one three, is indeed equal to the, the to the fraction of the transition rate from one uh, from one to three. Uh, over the transition rate from three to one. We recognize that these are the transition rates from one to three and from three to one. And similarly, when you look at uh, three to one. Okay, so if we design these penalty, remember these are penalty costs, right? Uh, the pa parameters in the penalty function. If we design these parameters in, in, in this way to satisfy in a way that this in a, this equality is satisfied, then the two model coincides. And if the two model coincide, then I talk about decision makers, I talk about players, I talk about robust mean field games, but what you recognize is that we are talking essentially about the biological model of one that we introduced at the beginning. And that's pretty much it uh, for uh, this presentation, and I'd be happy to take any questions you might have. Thanks. Thank you, Dario. 
I would start with the question. So you were talking about prescriptive models. So yeah. you 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 were looking for condition under which your model is uh, satisfying certain uh, certain equilibrium and so on. But um, what is the step? I didn't get what is the step to impose that uh, the only be the model, the Markov model, or the only be really behaves as the, the switching uh, system. How can you change their behavior or their okay. ra ratio? Let's see. Well, okay. When you have a model, you can analyze the model, but the 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 the, the gamma and the r these are the cost penalty. Uh, these are parameters of the model. So the main idea was how can we design these parameters in a way that when we solve the model, and by solving the model I mean you solve the Anto Jacobi Isaacs equation, the distribution, then you obtain exactly the same transition rates of the honeybees. And uh, this was mentioned uh, towards the end, but thanks for, for asking because then I, I can stress a little bit more. So there's a way to design those parameters, which means designing the game boils down to designing those parameters gamma and r. This is the, 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 the penalty to parameters in the, in, the, in the objective function. And if we uh, make sure that those fractions are equal, then the resulting uh, no, I understand the understand that um, designing uh, the game then you obtain so you change you you look for the solution and then uh, try I mean is uh, the, yeah, the it's inverse, game theory. inverse game theory I understand this but my question is um, can you really impose some control to obtain this some external control some I don't know Oh, okay. That, that's a very, very good point. Uh, so the idea is the following. In inverse game theory and in, in, this, in this approach, we uh, keep the individual rationality of people. So the, the rho star and the omega star, we have, we have no controls. So they are obtained by solving the game. What we are doing is we are in changing the parameters of the game so that the rho star and omega star, they reflect what we want them to reflect. So to your question, sir, whether we introduce some input, no, we are just changing the parameter. We are retuning the game in a way that when you solve the game, and solving the game means everybody is rational. Everybody wants to maximize or minimize his own. So you are not forcing the behavior of the people. Mm -hmm. You are just designing incentive. Let me, let, me, let me say it differently. You are just designing incentives in a way that even if somebody is rational, then in the end, you obtain the, the, the desired results you want with the group. Okay. But that, that's a very good point. Mm, please, sorry, I don't want to, I mean, please, if somebody from the audience has a question or curiosity even more, I mean, uh, Dario has, has worked on the infield games and the uh, application on opinion dynamics. He's presenting this, but he has many other papers on the topic. So. Please go on with questions or uh, curiosity. We have, uh, I mean, now we have a uh, lot of students in the in the audience, so maybe they are shy. I don't know. <laughs> Please. No questions. <laughs> Graziana, please. Hey, yes, I was um, thinking about uh, the applications of this kind of uh, theory. So the opinion dynamics, uh, which are the main fields where you uh, try to apply this kind of uh, theoretical findings and uh, which were the results in this sense? Yeah, that, that's a very good point. They usually it, that the answer to this question is not easy because whenever it, you, you, so it, it's it's like uh, asking how can you incorporate in your uh, engineering systems the human behavior? Because when we talk about game theory, we talk a lot about uh, behavioral aspects. And uh, so it's a challenge because to capture the behavior of people is much more difficult than to identify the behavior of machine. So it's a challenge. 
But at the same time, it's also what makes things more interesting. So this idea of a holistic approach, right? Uh, it's in energy, in transportation, uh, and also in, in social technical systems. Uh, everybody is looking at the holistic approach. What does it mean? Well, you have to take into account that in the end, those who make decisions are people. So you cannot design a, 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 an engineering a transportation system in the same way uh, as you design a, a car, because the car is just a physical uh, uh, machine. Then you can use Newton's law and, and everything works, right? You have to identify the parameters. But when you have humans in the loop and you have behavioral threats, you have people making decisions, you have to take into account phenomena like inattention. So people, don't, they don't pay attention. Or if you are talking about energy systems and you want to do the uh, demand response, right? You, you want to incentivize or disincentivize people from using consumption, from consuming energy. Uh, you can increase the price of the electricity, but some people, they are not uh, paying attention. I, I, I don't pay attention usually. So I do, or uh, so there is inattention, there is inertia. So people, they, they, you, you have to really, uh, it takes a lot of time to, 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 to change the behavior of people. Uh, you have stubbornness. So people, they, they keep thinking that this is the right choice and they don't change their choice even if, if around them, everybody's saying no, the other choice is much better. So when it comes to humans in the loop, behavioral uh, traits, it's an additional challenging. So I don't have a full answer to your question, but we can also turn this into, into, into something which makes the, the problem more interesting. Thank you. Thanks a lot to Dario. You're welcome. Mario, can you stop sharing so that we can see your face? Okay. Maybe I now? I close the um, the recording so maybe people is feeling more uh, free. Uh, okay. <laughs> now I can say anything. <laughs>